having me here today. Uh, we, we are doing a, a number of things uh, uh, to move this effort along in the way of criminal justice reform. Uh, and, I, and I'll highlight uh, as many as I can, but they, they are not all encompassing, and I will just say that up front. Uh, the, the biggest one that you know about is collaborative reform, which you know started under my predecessor, my mentor, and my friend Charles Ramsey, uh, where you know the Justice Department was brought in to look at many of our policies. Uh, while he was here, we had gotten, I guess, a third of them completed. We are continuing to move that forward. Uh, we've got we had that um, collaborative reform group, uh, CNA, come in about two weeks ago. They were very happy with the progress that we're making so far. So we're being proactive in, in our efforts to improve our interactions with community uh, on a number of issues, uh, not the least of which is police-involved shootings and, and many other things and endeavors that we have. So we, we're very happy about that. We still got some work to do as many of the 91 recommendations are have several components to them. So it's not just 91, as you know. There are many, many involved. But we're, we're very happy about that. We've also uh, undertaken an endeavor last year with bias-based uh, police training with Dr. Lori Fridell, where we're basically, we all know we have implicit biases. I don't care who you are, what color you are, what gender you are, you have implicit biases. And it's just a matter of getting in tune with those, getting in touch with those, understanding what motivates you, understanding what motivates your thinking, and incorporating that, that whole line of, of thought within policing and training. And so all our commanders have gotten that training. We've got an additional 22 police officers that have started that training. It's so important to continue to do this. Uh, you know, awareness is, is the biggest thing that we have to do and, and understanding that we all have issues that we may need to address. Um, the, the one that we're probably most proud of is one that Councilman, it was started by the gentleman seated to your left, uh, Kevin Bethel, uh, in that when he came on with this, uh, this whole issue of diversion, uh, it has impacted uh, the city and the department immensely in a positive way, in that you know, we, we are taking probably 50 to 60 percent fewer kids in custody, particularly from school-related issues. Um, just to give an example, one of the things he had realized in his um, analysis is that a lot of times, um, you know, you had some climate and safety people were intervening in fights and that kids were getting charged with felonies or, or other school offenses when, when it really wasn't necessary and intervening. And this is not an, an indictment of them. It's just a matter of how the process was going. But it's so important for these kids not to be in the system in the first place, as you all know. And that's a critical step. So we, we are very, very proud of that. We continue the work that he started because it has uh, really yielded significant uh, inroads and, and moved the, the ball forward for us. Um, we, we, as I said before, we don't want to put kids in the system unnecessarily. So that's something that we are just so very happy of. As you know, we're also very intentional about the many community groups that we deal with across the city. We have deputies, for example, it's important enough to have deputy commissioners assigned to different interest groups. We have uh, one who's assigned to the Asian community. Uh, we have uh, one who, well, myself, actually now, I kept the police chaplain program. Um, and, and there are others that we deal with across the city. It's just so important for us to make these connections, to establish to these groups how important it is for us to cultivate relationships across the city. We've even, him and I, meaning Deputy uh, Bethel or Kevin Bethel, uh, we established a young millennial group last year. One, one of the things that I'm trying to be very intentional about is connecting with that demographic that we don't typically have. You've been to more community meetings, councilmen, and folks than you can ever count. And typically that demographic of folks in their 20s and 30s, particularly young men, are not there. And it's not because they're not productive members of societies. They might be do other things, doing other things. But we have to be intentional about connecting with them in order to really do what we're all trying to do. Because it can't just be about police community relations as it relates to people in their 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. I mean, we have to have people who are younger, and that's what's critical. And so we're working very hard to uh, deal with that. We have somebody who also deals with the LGBTQ community. Because, you know, I, one thing I am very careful about and I am very intentional about when I hear either someone from the press or someone who's an elected official who makes community singular, I quickly say, no, it should have an S behind it because all of our communities are plural in nature. And I'm going to be very honest about something else. 
we have gotten to the point where in police community relations, we say community, and that seems to be synonymous with color. And so the reality of it is, is even within the scope of communities of color, there's more than one within Philadelphia. And so not every community feels the same way about police. Not every district feels the same way. And so you got to be aware of all those things. So it's communities with an S and not be so drawn into saying the community feels this way or the community feels that way, because that's not a fair assessment of how anyone feels. We can't make those assumptions. Um, Explorers program. Again, you know, we decentralized that, and that is helping us. I mean, it was already a very diverse program, but obviously from a logistical standpoint, it was difficult for young kids to uh, get all the way uh, to the Northeast, and it's probably even more difficult now. So having it out in the districts, in the divisions, is, we're, we're getting some significant participation in that. Obviously, some districts are better than others. But these are things that are helping us making those connections with people, opening up more PAL centers. You've all heard those PAL testimonials from some of those PAL kids. Phenomenal in what they've done. And it doesn't matter what the race of the police officer is. I mean, when you hear these kids talk about the impact these PAL officers have on them, it is absolutely amazing. And all this stuff trickles down. I mean, you, you may have even seen some of the things that have happened with police officers up in Northwest. There's a particular one who's up there getting out of his car all the time. And we've got people who do this that go unheralded in many instances. The news doesn't necessarily know about it. And again, this transcends race. You know, we have black officers, white officers, males, females who are getting out there really being intentional about trying to connect with communities who really understand what that's all about and trying to make sure that even our police officers in this climate recognize that just because an individual group or an individual takes issue with a police action across this nation or here doesn't necessarily mean they're indicting the entire profession. And so we even have to be careful not to succumb to that. And so a lot of these things you got to stay on top of. Your messaging has to be very clear to the rank and file about what you're trying to accomplish, why it's important to make these inroads, why it doesn't really make any sense to put a bunch of cases on people. You just saw this from the Democratic National Convention, and thank you for those kudos. But largely it had a lot to do with what Mayor Kenny had started with marijuana and, and making sure that we close that gap in disparity. And so by virtue of being able to issue these code violation notices, instead of putting people in the system with summaries, I mean, we're able to, first of all, not clog up the system, which as it relates to the DNC helped us immensely. You may have heard me say that some of those protesters were in and out of our custody so quickly their heads were spinning. They didn't even realize what was happening. You know, they were written a citation, given a bottle of water and say, you know, have a nice day. And uh, so they were really pleasantly surprised about that. And it, so we're also trying to make sure that we continue that effort as it relates to, you know, disparate treatment in the criminal justice system with things like marijuana. The mayor, myself, have tried to explain to multiple people why, you know, it doesn't pay us to put a summary violation on somebody when you have two different violations, one for up to 30 grams of marijuana and another person potentially charged with a open alcohol container. It makes no sense. And so by virtue of him being successful with you folks and council and pushing that forward, it was the timing was impeccable for the convention, and I keep coming back to that. But it's just all those things dovetail into one another and making sure that everybody understands, look, I'm very pragmatic. I understand that even within the rank and file, there's some people you got to kind of drag along a little bit, and, and they may not quite get it at first. But I think when they understand that there's a benefit to them and that there's no benefit to just putting a bunch of people in the system unnecessarily, then I think we'll move this ball forward. The other thing that has happened and that has taken, been under a lot of scrutiny has been the reduction or the removal of the 60 credits. And uh, let me say this to you. There, there are a lot of pundits out there who would suggest that now the worst thing in the world has happened. A lot of folks have bemoaned the notion that, you know, cultural awareness and a whole bunch of other things will go by the wayside. The first thing that I say to that is if you want to be culturally aware, you have to be intentional about being culturally aware. If you just decide just because you have a PhD or you think because you have a PhD, you're going to automatically be culturally aware, you're naive. If you're interested in getting to know another culture, then you have to be intentional about learning that culture. So 60 credits does not necessarily get that. In addition to which, I think there are people who did not understand that 
just because we had that 60 credit requirement didn't mean that everybody who came in had 60 credits. You had people coming in with the military. You had people coming through the explorers. So two thirds of the people who were coming in probably didn't even have the 60 credits. But let me just clear that up. In addition to which, I don't have the luxury, like some of the experts and the pundits, of talking about this as they can sit on the sideline and talk about 60 credits while my department is shrinking and we're losing diversity. Now let me elaborate on that a little bit. For me, it's more about even inclusion. It's more about who I'm not getting than who I am getting. I don't take any issue with having a number of Caucasian officers. I got some of the best cops I got and the biggest hearts that I got come from some of these white males and whatever. So to make that indictment, I don't allow that to happen. But what I am losing, I'm losing females. I'm losing young black men. I'm losing people who reflect the demographic of the city. So when people sit on the sideline and they talk about, well, why couldn't you do this? Why couldn't you do that? All those things we've tried 10 times over. And meanwhile, our department still isn't growing. And meanwhile, the demographics are going in the wrong way. And so we need to be very careful that we see what the bigger picture is. You are seated again. I reference him again. The guy sitting next to you has a master's degree. He's going to a number of programs. And under that 60 credit requirement would not have been in this police department. He would never have been here. OK, just like my captain in the 18th district, who's a single mother who now also has a master's degree degree. She came on this job with no credits, but she got educated like many of the police officers do. Both of them have tremendous hearts. They're hardworking people, just like many of the police officers are, not the least of which we cannot forget that this is a city that has one of the highest poverty rates of the top 10 cities in the country. And police, fire, prisons, and a few others are a gateway to the middle class. And so why should we lose sight of that? It's to me, it's ludicrous that people would take their own residents and decide to exclude them for the sake of some arbitrary requirement. I mean, I'm a proponent of education. So anyone who thinks that is mistaken. But I also am a proponent of public safety and providing a level of service to the people who live, work, and visit here that they deserve. And I cannot afford to sit back and debate it because it sounds good to people for whatever reason they think it sounds good. So in a nutshell, we, we will continue to be progressive in this police department. Um, we will continue to move the ball forward with regard to establishing and cultivating relationships with communities, ones that we already have good relationships with. We will continue to do that and ones where we struggle and we acknowledge that we struggle, it, struggle in them. We will continue to, to move that ball forward because you will not get this done by yourself. That's just the bottom line. Whether it's police community relations, whether it deals with crime in communities, the only way you'll find a modicum of success or success in general is if you collaborate and work together. That actually concludes my testimony. I will answer any questions that you may have at this point.